Distinguished visitors, ladies and gentlemen, and visitors watching online, welcome to the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. My name is Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Kenyatta Ruffin, currently a White House Fellow, and I'll be your Master of Ceremony for today's event, Reflections on the Legacy of Black Service Members in the U.S. Armed Services. To begin today's program in celebration of Black History Month, we'll have a short video presentation, followed by remarks by Mr. Kevin Young, the Andrew W. Mellon Director of the National Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture, and editor of the poetry section of the New Yorker magazine. The National Museum of African American History and Culture is the 19th museum of the Smithsonian Institution. It shares stories of optimism, struggle, strength, resilience, and perseverance. After breaking ground in 2012, the nearly 400,000 square foot museum opened its doors on September 24, 2016. As visitors enter the museum, they first encounter Heritage Hall. Heritage Hall, along with spaces like the Oprah Winfrey Theater, offer public gathering space for many programs and events. Many visitors begin their journey by heading down to the History Galleries, the foundation for the museum's content. The first gallery is Slavery and Freedom beginning in 15th century Africa and Europe, extending through the founding of the United States and concluding with the nation's transformation during the Civil War and Reconstruction. The intentionally enclosed space adds a physical dimension to our visitor's journey through the Middle Passage content. In defending freedom, defining freedom, the era of segregation, visitors explore the years following the end of Reconstruction and how the nation struggled to define the status of African Americans. This gallery holds two of the museum's largest objects, a segregated Southern Railway car and a guard tower from Angola State Prison, Louisiana. The final history gallery, A Changing America, 1968 and Beyond, explores contemporary life through stories about social, economic, political, and cultural experiences of African Americans, from the death of Martin Luther King Jr. to the second election of Barack Obama. The history galleries end as visitors pass through the contemplative court, a reflective space to decompress, think, and meditate. The Explore More interactive space on the museum's second floor is a multifaceted educational space designed to complement and expand on themes and topics presented in other exhibition galleries. The Earl W. and Amanda Stafford Center for African American Media Arts, or CAMA, is dedicated to examining the formation of African American history and culture through the media arts. The second floor is also home to the Robert Frederick Smith Explore Your Family History Center. The third floor of the museum is dedicated to our community galleries. Making a way out of no way, this gallery explores themes of agency, creativity, and resilience through personal stories of African Americans who challenge racial oppression and discrimination. Sports, leveling the playing field, explores the contributions of athletes both on and off the field. Some are symbols of astounding athletic ability, while others are social activists who have taken their presence beyond the courtroom, boardroom, and newsroom. Double Victory, the African-American military experience, conveys a sense of appreciation and respect for the military service of African Americans from the American Revolution to the War on Terror. Power of Place explores regional history, helping visitors connect to their own places of significance. This gallery showcases 10 place studies, providing intimate views into distinct moments of the African American experience.
Musical Crossroads tells the story of African-American music from the arrival of the first Africans to the present day. The exhibition features African-American music makers of all genres and styles, while demonstrating how African-American music provided a voice for liberty, justice, and social change. Nestled in the culture galleries is the Rhymes Family Foundation Gallery of Visual Art and the American Experience. It is the only permanent art exhibition on the Smithsonian Mall dedicated to demonstrating the critical role American artists of African descent played in shaping the history of American art. Taking the Stage explores the history of African Americans in theater, film, and television. Visitors can reconnect with some of their favorite popular culture memories and contemplate how the roles played on stage and screen reflected changing aspirations, struggles, and realities for African Americans. The museum's top-level fifth floor houses executive offices and meeting rooms, including the Solomon Brown Suite and the Council Room. As a museum of the Smithsonian, the largest research complex in the world, the NMAAHC is part of a robust community of leaders, scholars, and philanthropists. The National Museum of African American History and Culture strives to facilitate a national dialogue on race and foster a spirit of healing and reconciliation. Good morning, everyone. Oh, good. You, you all learned well uh, to say good morning when said to. I'm Kevin Young. I'm the Andrew W. Mellon Director of the National Museum of African American Culture, and it's such a pleasure to have you this morning. I hope you enjoyed that short overview of the museum and that you'll take a few minutes following this program to explore the history galleries and the rest of the museum. We're so honored to have you with us here today and to have additional folks from the Department of Defense joining us by live broadcast. My late father actually served in the Army, was ROTC, and a veteran of the Chemical Corps, which helped him go to college at his HBCU, Southern University in Louisiana. So without either rich traditions of the military or historically black colleges and universities, I wouldn't be here today, uh, and not just because that's where he met my mother, I so deeply appreciate, thus, uh, the conversation we're having today about our military and the lives and service of our African-American soldiers. I want to extend a special welcome to our honored guests today who will participate in today's program, Reflections on the Legacies of Black Americans in the U.S. Armed Services. Mr. Dennis Richard McDonough, the 11th United States Secretary of Veterans Affairs. Also, Congressman Sanford Bishop of Georgia's 2nd District, Sinclair Harris, retired Rear Admiral of the United States Navy, and Lieutenant Colonel Kenyatta Ruffin, White House Fellow and F-16 fighter pilot, who moderate the panel. You know, one thing we talk about a lot here at the museum is living history. And this idea is that the past is connected to the present and indeed to the future, and that history is living through all of us. It lives in us, and we live through it and we can make history together. And part of our mission is to create space and convene conversations about the complexity of our nation's history in this current moment. Today's program is an excellent example of that, and we're honored to host all of you for this important conversation. Thank you all for joining us and helping to make history, and now I am honored to welcome Lieutenant Colonel Ruffin to introduce the program. Thank you again. At this time, we will host a 30-minute panel with the following distinguished panelists. The Honorable Dennis McDonough is the 11th Secretary of Veterans Affairs and served as the 26th White House Chief of Staff, a career public servant with experience on the National Security Council. He has faithfully worked on behalf of veterans and the military families for several decades. 
He believes deeply that it is our shared sacred obligation to, quote, to uphold our promises to our veterans, whether they came home decades ago or days ago. Next, Congressman Sanford D. Bishop Jr. represents Middle and Southwest Georgia's second congressional district. Representative Bishop has served on the House Committee of Appropriations since 2003, is the vice chair of the Military Construction Veterans Affairs and Related Activities Subcommittee, and serves as the co-chair of the Congressional Military Families Caucus. Additionally, Representative Bishop served in the U.S. Army from 1969 to 1971. Joining us, we also have Rear Admiral Retired Sinclair Harris, who is a 34-year veteran of the U.S. Navy. Admiral Harris led joint, combined, multinational, and interagency organizations over the course of his career, culminating in the Vice Director of Operations for the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He currently serves as the President of the National Naval Officers Association, a professional development organization with the mission to achieve a diverse officer corps that reflects the demographics of our nation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our distinguished panelists. Thank you again for being here today. And we are obviously here to celebrate Black History Month and the legacy of US service members, many of them here uh, as they have served our country faithfully. But we'd be remiss if we didn't recognize our security challenges of today. And many of you may know that Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin was originally scheduled to be on this panel, but he's currently meeting with the president due to the security challenges in the Ukraine. Yet, we would be remiss if we did not recognize and applaud his position as the first ever black American to lead the U.S. Department of Defense. We also know here in this museum they have a couple of exhibits featuring former Secretary of State and Chairman Joint Chiefs of Staffs Colin Powell who is another uh, one of the most successful black American military professionals in our history. So I want to start with opening. Can you reflect on, for each of the panelists, can you reflect on some of your memories or relationship with either of those two American heroes? Sure, uh, Colonel, thanks very much. And uh, Chairman, it's great to be here with you. Admiral, great to be here with you. Uh, and it's particularly great to be with uh, these young uh, heroes here uh, and everybody joining us by uh, video. I have a story, I think, that combines uh, these two uh, remarkable leaders in an important attribute that they share. And that is uh, commitment to uh, recruiting, training, and building uh, future and even current leaders in the country. Uh, in fact, just over the last several days, I reached out to Secretary Austin, who's been a, an invaluable partner to me as I've taken on this job at the Veteran, Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, and I asked for his help in recruiting uh, to our team a uh, very strong um, leader of color. And notwithstanding the amazing demands on his schedule, he picked up, he picked up the phone and made the call. And not only that, I knew that he had relationship with this particular person because he has dedicated so much of his life uh, to leadership development and looking out for the next generation of leaders, which is uh, where I then transitioned to General Powell, Secretary Powell. Um, he was a regular in the White House uh, in providing counsel, always quiet, always professional, uh, always insightful to President Obama, who routinely reached out to General Powell. Uh, but I also reached out to him on occasion. And 
the pre it was very important to President Obama that we develop what we call the President's Leadership Workshop to lift up future leaders of color among the federal workforce. So we had a six-week cur uh, curriculum every Saturday morning in the Eisenhower Building. Our first speaker in that series arrived on the White House campus, with which he was very familiar, in his Corvette, going right up the uh, West Exec Avenue between the West Wing and the Eisenhower Building, and that's General Paul. Every time we asked him for his help, not only to advise the president, but his help in developing future leaders, the answer was, yes, Dennis, now what's the question? He was so committed to making sure that we had the best and the brightest as we do in this room and on the screen that he and General Austin to this, Secretary Austin to this day, dedicate a big amount of their time every day to doing precisely that. I've got some stories that I would love to share uh, about General Powell as well as uh, uh, General Austin. Uh, I represent uh, Fort Benning, the Maneuver Center of Excellence. Um, I came to learn that uh, General Powell did a lot of training at Fort Benning, spent a lot of time in the Columbus, Georgia, Phoenix City, Alabama, Fort Benning area. Uh, as a member of Congress, I worked with uh, the local veterans organizations and the National uh, Infantry Association uh, to develop the uh, National Infantry Museum and Soldier Center uh, at, uh, adjacent to Fort Benning, Georgia. And of course, uh, it required a lot of fundraising, but that was a very strong effort, was successful, and uh, they wanted to have a very, very important person to come and cut the ribbon. And so I was tasked to join in asking uh, John Powell if he would come and be our keynote speaker and cut the ribbon, and he did. And he did it because of his affection for, uh, even in times of difficulty and discrimination, uh, in the South, uh, he uh, felt uh, the pangs of discrimination. Uh, he lived off post, he lived in Phoenix City, Alabama. Some of you may have heard of the Phoenix City story. Uh, but he nevertheless uh, executed his duties as a soldier extremely well. Uh, went up the ranks and obviously uh, loved the infantry and came back uh, because the Soldier Center uh, is just that. It celebrates the infantry and the soldiers uh, who have been a part and are part of the infantry. So Colonel Powell came, was very gracious, uh, was just well received, and of course he's got a number of, uh, of streets uh, named for him uh, in the area. Uh, his quarters, uh, where he lived at Fort Benning, are part of the African American Trail at Fort Benning, uh, which is a part of the uh, Department of Defense's uh, uh, cultural uh, uh, innovations. And I'm very, very pleased with that. With respect to Secretary Austin, uh, as a congressman, I represented uh, Thomas County, Georgia. And I came to learn that uh, uh, that was uh, a very, very prominent young man. I got contacted by the local Chamber of Commerce who wanted to uh, celebrate a hometown boy done good. And that was uh, General Lloyd Austin, who was born and reared in Thomasville, Georgia, uh, in the era of uh, uh, just uh, after uh, segregation uh, had uh, been officially ended. Uh, he was fortunate enough to go to the uh, military academy at West Point. Uh, he followed the very first graduate, African-American graduate of, the, uh, uh, of West Point, who was uh, Henry O. Flipper, who was also from Thomasville, Thomas County, Georgia. Uh, General Austin did well, and the ceremony uh, where I was uh, to give him the award from the local Chamber of Commerce uh, was held at the local country club, which was a country club where when General Austin was growing up, he could not go unless he was working uh, in the kitchen or on the grounds. Uh, so uh, things 
traversed a long way. Uh, General Austin uh, came from Thomasville, Georgia, and now our Secretary of Defense. So I never had the honor of actually meeting uh, Secretary Powell or General Powell. I did have the honor of meeting and working with um, Secretary and then General Austin uh, when we were both in uniform. But I would tell you that there are four, there are many characteristics of leadership, and we study them all the time in the military. But there are four that really come to mind when I think about both of these gentlemen that was an example, I think, for myself and for many, many others as we aspired um, to rise up the rank of military. Both of them were ex excellent examples of complete competence in their jobs. Whether they were in uniform or out, they knew what they were doing, they directed well, they did their homework, they had complete competence, and I have yet to find anyone who has said anything to make me think otherwise. They were men of confidence. Leaders need to be confident, not cocky, but need to be confident in what they're doing, what their units are doing, what their organization is doing, and I saw the same thing from the State Department to the Pentagon, uh, especially with General Powell, Secretary Powell. They need to have courage, especially moral courage. I don't think I need to go into any details about that, especially today. <laughs> and I'm not making accusations against either administrations who are now here or in the past. But moral courage in our military leaders is always important, always important. And both of them were examples of that. And then the last, and again, there are many, many um, attributes of leadership, but compassion. Being able to have empathy. Being able to put themselves in the shoes and the boots of their soldiers, their airmen, their sailors, their guardians now with the space for empathy and compassion. So those four things, I think, are critically important for leaders, and both of them were great examples to me. Thank you all for sharing, and I'll add that I would not be here on the stage right now if we're not for General Powell. I first learned of the White House Fellowship Program while reading his autobiography as a cadet at the U.S. Air Force Academy. And so speaking of the Air Force, I would like to kind of elevate the conversation up to the 50,000 foot level, <laughs> sir. And uh, so <laughs> Representative Bishop, can you talk about why we as a nation should even celebrate Black History Month? Yes. Uh, for many reasons, uh, and celebrate uh, is a key word. Um, African American history is a major part of American history. You can't really celebrate American history without celebrating uh, African American history. Uh, African Americans uh, have often been overlooked in terms of the history of this country as it's been recorded. Uh, however, our contributions as African Americans have been immeasurable uh, in all aspects of American life, uh, whether it's education or the arts or scientists, uh, political leaders, uh, labor leaders, uh, educational leaders, uh, uh, soldiers, sailors, uh, airmen. Uh, every aspect of American life has been permeated and has had leadership from African Americans. And of course, it's important uh, that African Americans uh, know the value that we bring and have brought uh, to the history of this great nation. Uh, and it's important that all Americans and all the world uh, also know the value of uh, African Americans in the history of, of this nation. And so it's, it's extremely important. Uh, and if you, we are celebrating now African Americans in the military, uh, and veterans, and uh, as we look back uh, just on military history, the first patriot, the first uh, casualty in the American Revolution was Crispus Attucks, an African American. Uh, Ten percent of the troops in the Civil War were African American. Um, 
I mentioned Henry O. Flipper. Uh, he was uh, one of the Buffalo Soldiers. Uh, as uh, our nation moved west and the Buffalo Soldiers are segregated, all black unit was sent out west to help secure uh, the area as our nation progressed west. Uh, if you uh, think about the, um, uh, the Tuskegee Airmen, uh, who were segregated and obviously uh, were, were not uh, believed to be capable, uh, but turned out to, 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 to be heroic uh, figures uh, in World War II. Uh, and of course, the uh, Munford Port Marines, the first Marines to African Americans to be in the Marine Corps who trained uh, in separate uh, areas, segregated. Uh, but made tremendous contributions. And then you look, look forward. Uh, you look at, uh, for example, um, General uh, Johnny Wilson, uh, who commanded the Army Material Command and left a tremendous legacy there. And then you've got uh, General, uh, Lieutenant General uh, Al Edmonds, uh, who directed uh, the Defense Information Systems Agency. Uh, and was really responsible for bringing military communications into the internet era uh, back in the, the early 90s. And of course, you got um, uh, Lieutenant General Willie Williams, who was uh, Chief of Marine Corps Staff and did a heck of a job uh, with the Marine Corps in uh, bringing it uh, and showing equity and uh, guiding the Commandant uh, in that regard. And then you got uh, um, uh, Admiral Michelle Howard of the Navy. Uh, Admiral Howard, uh, she was commander of U.S. Naval Forces Europe, Naval Forces Africa, and the Allied Joint Force Command in Naples. A powerful sister. <laughs> powerful. Uh, and of course, uh, General Nadia West, 44th Surgeon General of the Army. You know, when we celebrate black history and now African Americans' involvement in the military, uh, it allows us to really understand our value and to have others understand that value. And uh, it adds to the, the mosaic of the great American mosaic that is made up of the diversity of this country. And so we must celebrate uh, African-American history as a part of American history because it's an essential uh, part of that history. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that. And I completely agree. And, and what resonated with me is the word value. Um, and that is uh, something that hopefully everyone feels about themselves and about each other. And so related to that, Secretary McDonough, is value, the, the value that the Biden-Harris administration has placed on advancing racial equity. So can you tell us a little bit about how the Department of Veterans Affairs has taken on that guidance? Yeah, thanks very much. And uh, so if you just take a step back and look at uh, our uh, uh, veterans who get care from us in the Veterans Health Administration, uh, 23% of those veterans are black veterans. The fastest growing cohort of uh, veterans, and we see this in uh, the future force and we see that in the active force, are women veterans. And so we have uh, begun a data inequity um, effort to make sure that we are uh, ensuring that we can provide world-class care and timely access to world-class earned benefits based on uh, the force as it is manifesting today. Because today's active duty force are tomorrow's veterans. And we have to, uh, as going all the way back to General Washington, who said, uh, our ability to field future generations of military leaders will be directly related to how well we treat the veterans of today. And so, in addition to making sure that our data drives our decision making, we're making sure that 
we have the kinds of timely access to world-class treatment and gender-specific treatment that women veterans, women veterans of color, are right to expect of VA. Which brings me to the third point. So those are two very concrete uh, ways we're trying to operationalize this equity agenda. One is uh, a data and equity effort. Two is a very um, uh, strong focus on ensuring that we have world-class care for women veterans, our fastest growing cohort of, vet of veterans. And third is having uh, providers who look like the force. And the question about that uh, is, uh, and the reason to do that is twofold. One, we're all made in the image of God. Every one of our veterans are made in the image of God. And it is the right thing to do. Second, the outcomes when we have a more diverse healthcare force are better for our veterans. We know that a pregnant or expecting mother of color treated by experts of color have better outcomes as it relates to child and maternal health. That's why we have health care. Second, we know that men of color treated by health care professionals of color do better on important health care indicators like cardiac health. And that is why we are in the business of health care. I'll say one last thing about uh, the diversification of our healthcare force and the focus on equity. I am blessed to work with a chief of staff in the Department of Veterans Affairs, herself a third generation soldier. Her dad, a combat vet of Vietnam. She, a lieutenant colonel, retired, a combat vet of, her, of Iraq. Her grandpa, an army bugler, who became the conductor of Pershing's own. That tradition in her family strengthens America over the generations. And the question for us at VA is, how are we positioned to ensure that we can continue that tradition and garner the strength that comes from it? So that's how we put the equity uh, agenda in action, into action. Awesome, thank you, sir. Admiral Harris, we're talking about legacy here of black service members, and you've served uh, your country in uniform for over three decades. Uh, and your journey, though, began right here in, in Northeast, Northeast, how you say it? And so can you talk about your journey and your path from right here in DC to commanding naval forces all across the globe? So one of my good friends is uh, Admiral Jim Stavridis, and he has a book called The Accidental Admiral. And I always tell him, no, I'm the accidental admiral. <laughs> I, um, I went to high school here at Gonzaga College High School, and I applied for the Naval Academy, did not get selected. So um, I was going to enlist in the Navy because I didn't want to go in the Army, even though my mother was in the Army, and so were several of my uncles, because I don't like camping. You guys do like camping in the army. <laughs> so no one doing camping. So um, I was gonna do that. Then my uncle, my uncle Chuck, he just passed away. He was in the you know, Air Force. Uh, and he said, no, I want you to go ahead to college. You're smart enough to go to college. So I always do what my uncle Chuck said because he's the sharpest knife in the drawer. And uh, finished that, Came, graduated from James Madison, found a job afterwards, was working here as one of the consultants in town, and I realized after about four months, you know, I'm not in love, not married, don't have any kids, and I'm bored out of my mind. I hated my job, 
hated it. And I still want to see the world, so five things. And uh, so I went by the recruiting office and said, hey, what do you got? I graduated from uh, James Madison with a degree in economics less than a year ago. And you guys are building the 600-ship Navy? Do you need sailors on that? And uh, I said, sure. I took the test. Next thing you know, I went to Officer Candidate School, and 34 years later, I retired. And, and I was telling uh, the representative and telling the secretary, you know, so why'd you stay in? I stayed in for two reasons. Number one, I learned to love my shipmates, Marines, even soldiers, <laughs> airmen, Coast Guardsmen. I learned to, the civilians that work in government. I learned to love the people I worked with. And I learned to love the excitement. Every day was new. My last job, Vice Director of Operations. Let me tell you, every day was new. From Ebola to evacuations, uh, taking care of undocumented children, to the ISIS crisis, and everything in between, every day was fascinating. So. Sir, you started to touch on a little bit about why you joined, and so I'm going to pass it back over to Representative Bishop. If you could also talk about um, why black Americans and really anyone should join the military. I remember during the Obama administration, there was the Military Leadership Diversity Commission, and it talked about the DOD being the employer of choice for minority communities. So can you just talk about why uh, the DOD is such a great option? Uh, the military has uh, great opportunities for African Americans, or for any Americans for that matter, uh, but especially African Americans because, uh, one, if you uh, are in the military, if you are a veteran, you got the GI Bill. So you've got uh, the opportunity to have health care, you've got uh, the opportunity to go, to go to school, go to college, uh, uh, post-military. Uh, if you're contemplating going to college and you want to go into one of the reserve uh, components, ROTC, uh, uh, National Guard, uh, you have an opportunity there uh, to have a job uh, and go to school and have it paid for. Uh, and of course, uh, if you want to be a real patriot and, and be a leader in, in uh, the military, uh, you can, of course, uh, be with the best and the brightest and attend uh, some of the military academies. One of our military academies. They got uh, so be brighter than me, because they, <laughs> they didn't pick me. But it, it's a tremendous opportunity for, for growth and development. And uh, as a member of the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, we have been working very, very uh, hard to try to make sure that uh, our military uh, and we've always uh, been well represented in the military in terms of uh, people of color, but we want to make sure that our officers' ranks uh, reflect uh, the, 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 the demographics of, of our country, that the officers' ranks look like Here. America. And of course, we've worked very hard. We're working with the commandants of the various uh, academies uh, to do just that. Uh, and of course, under the leadership of our chairwoman, uh, Joyce Beatty of Ohio, uh, who's doing an incredibly job in leading us, uh, we're working with these veterans' issues and our military issues and the equity issues uh, to make sure uh, that uh, when we celebrate African American history, uh, there is equity across America. Secretary McDonough, you have finished up here recently, your first year uh, leading the Department of Defense, and again, your background both in government and outside of government has been extensive in your care and your concern for military personnel and our family, so I want to thank you uh, personally for that, sir. But I also want to ask, again, from the Airman's perspective, what's on the horizon uh, for this upcoming year, uh, your second year leading the VA? Well, thanks so much. The, I hope that we continue to make progress on our two core requirements, which is that we get our veterans timely access to world-class health care. Uh, and that means culturally competent health care. That means that our providers are the best trained in the world. And that means that our uh, providers also represent and look like uh, the strongest country in the world, which is ours. And the second is timely access to earned benefits. Uh, on benefits, we're particularly focused on, sorry, on healthcare, we're particularly focused on getting through the pandemic. And I know that there are um, 
veterans who have been concerned that maybe they shouldn't come in for their care because maybe they would be exposed or they would be taking uh, clinical time away from a veteran who's COVID positive. Uh, so we have a, a particular concern about deferred care. If you are a veteran who has deferred care, please defer no longer. Come in and see us. We'll get you in timely. We'll make sure that we get you updated and uh, make sure that we get all your care up to date. Um, this is particularly true for our black vets who uh, we know suffered more from COVID than white counterparts. So I wanna make sure that we are keeping care current, up-to-date, world-class. Second on provision of benefits. This is an issue uh, that uh, on a particular set of benefits that President Biden is the first president in 30 years to highlight and to begin to get uh, to treat with as a presumptive conditions connected to your service. And that is uh, particular conditions of sinusitis, rhinitis, or asthma due to exposure to toxins over 30 years of war in that big geographic expanse from Somalia in the southwest to Uzbekistan in the, in, in the northeast, including Iraq and Afghanistan right there in the middle. So if you are a vet who suffers from particular maladies or conditions that you believe are related to exposure to toxins, it's very important to us, very important to President Biden that you file your claims and come in and see us. And we're gonna continue, and you hear us, uh, us talking about this all this week, uh, led by our, uh, uh, our friends up on Capitol Hill who will be debating this. Uh, this will continue to be a major priority for, war, uh, for the second year here at this, uh, this administration. May I jump in? Absolutely. Uh, let, me, let me just say that uh, I co-chair the um, Congressional Black Caucus Foundation's uh, Veterans Brain Trust, uh, which was set up uh, over 35 years ago by a former congressman and uh, Korean War vet uh, Charlie Rangel of New York uh, to focus on the issues that are uh, uh, pertinent to African-American veterans. And of course, over the years, we've, we've touched on a lot of issues. And of course, uh, last year, we were fortunate to have uh, Secretary Austin and Secretary McDonough uh, to be keynote speakers. We had to do it virtually. We normally have it at the uh, convention center, but we did it virtually. But they focused on the impact of COVID uh, on African-American veterans in the Department of Defense, as well as the Department of Veterans Affairs. And of course, I have to, uh, uh, to really uh, uh, salute uh, the work that they've done in that regard. Uh, and we, as a Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, hearing from veterans and VSOs uh, uh, at our conferences, uh, have indicated that they needed to have caregivers that looked like them, uh, that didn't have uh, foreign accents that they could not understand. And of course, uh, that effort is well on the way now. And of course, uh, I am just delighted and I want to, to, to give you a, a, a salute uh, for, for that effort. And we on Capitol Hill are doing, I serve as a senior member of the Appropriations Committee. I uh, chair, I'm on the, um, I, the Military Construction Veterans Affairs Subcommittee, which funds um, many of the Department of Defense programs, but all of the Veterans Affairs programs. And of course, uh, we are supportive of the uh, uh, funds for mental health that the Secretary has referenced, uh, for female emphasis uh, on uh, gender care, gender specific care. Uh, and of course, uh, there are other uh, populations that, that uh, don't get the care that they need. Uh, and of course, uh, in rural America, uh, people all across rural America who are veterans, uh, including African Americans, uh, don't have access, uh, ready access. And of course, this administration is moving very, very rapidly to make that happen with, with virtual health care and extending the health care services for our, our, our rural veterans. And so I, I just want to give you accolades for that, uh, sir. Thank you, sir. 
I also, sir, want to thank you for your work on the Military Family Caucus. Uh, as a proud father of six, uh, and my family is, uh, yes, and one of them's here. Uh, I always, <laughs> always enjoy embarrassing her. <laughs> Thanks, thanks for sharing your dad with the country. <laughs> so I want to thank you for that. Uh, we're coming to a close here, but I want to get back to you, Admiral Harris, for one question, but it's uh, either or, either COA. Uh, can you talk about who inspired you or who does inspire you, or talk about how the military has changed since you first joined your choice? So there are many people that inspired me throughout uh, my time from family members. I mentioned my mother was in the Women's Army Corps. My uncle was in the United States Air Force. I had another, I had a Mumford Point Marine uncle. Uh, also had a Tuskegee Airman, who was another uncle who passed before ours. And, and their, their legacy always inspired me. I do want to touch on um, the change in the military and what's been important. And we've seen technology has changed. We've seen the global political military situation continues to evolve from the Cold War through the war on terror to whatever we are in today. Um, but I was talking to a few others, and I talked to a, a couple of my shipmates earlier today um, about this, and there's one thing that resides in my mind that has been the most important change in the United States military um, over my 34 years and since I left. One thing is the elevation of women in the United States military. It is without a doubt the most important thing that we have done to improve our leadership, our competence, our confidence, and our ability to respond to an ever-evolving change which, hey, guess what? Women are smart. <laughs> And they work hard. And what do you need in leadership? People that are smart and they work hard. And to cut off half of them and say, well, you can't do this, can't do that. Other thing, that's not very smart. Here, here. Here, here. Awesome. Unfortunately, we are ending our panel here, and we obviously know that our distinguished guests have very busy schedules, and we really do thank you and appreciate your time. But I want to offer you one last uh, final remark to say what you're most proud of uh, as we conclude Black History Month, or just any closing remarks for our audience. Sir, Secretary. Oh, I'd, I'd just direct your attention to a great speech that uh, Deputy Secretary Donald Remy uh, gave down at uh, the Sam Houston uh, National Cemetery in San Antonio mm -hmm. last week about um, the summary um, uh, mistreatment of 119 Buffalo soldiers mm -hmm. and the hanging of 17 and what it meant to Donald as uh, the son of a uh, highly decorated United States soldier, uh, combat vet from Vietnam, and Donald himself, a uh, soldier, a veteran. And in that story is uh, the story of generations of amazing black military leaders in this country's history, without whom uh, we would not be as strong a country as we are today. And I'm particularly mindful that generations of soldiers, Marines, sailors, airmen and women, Coast Guardsmen, fought wars to protect my freedoms and my rights and then had to come home and fight just as hard for their own rights and freedoms. And President Biden, Vice President Harris have been very clear to us that those days in VA are over. And I thank you all for the opportunity to be with you today and particularly uh, with my colleagues here. Thank you. Let, let me just say that uh, I am 
grateful to be a part of this program. I'm grateful that the administration has really, really elevated the issue of equity. Uh, and I am just so happy that the Department of Defense of the United States of America is serious about erasing uh, the stigma that has been associated with the, the racial history of this country. Uh, the naming commission, for example, that uh, Admiral Howard is uh, 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 the chair of, uh, which is now going to uh, uh, rename, uh, make recommendations for the, the renaming of the, uh, the military facilities that are named for, uh, for traitors, for the Confederate uh, generals. And for acknowledging the Department of Defense is acknowledging uh, the terrible history of discrimination that has uh, been a part of our ranks. And it's working actively to make sure that we don't have supremacists in our force. <laughs> Finally, last year, um, uh, I participated in a ceremony uh, at Fort Benning uh, which commemorated, uh, that celebrate, but commemorated uh, the lynching, uh, the only known recorded lynching of a black soldier on a military installation, and it was at Fort Benning. Uh, but the Department of Defense, uh, the Army, uh, actually acknowledged it uh, and put a marker on the place where the lynching took place and also uh, made a part of the African American uh, Heritage Trail at Fort Benning uh, the uh, location of the segregated uh, facilities that uh, soldiers who were subjected to uh, racial discrimination and the segregation of uh, African Americans in particular, uh, where they lived and preserved that uh, for history's sake so that we won't repeat it. Uh, I think it was somebody who said that he who uh, does not know his history is doomed to repeat it. Well, the fact that our Department of Defense is moving to get us to the point where we understand uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly so that we won't repeat the ugly uh, is something that is very heartwarming to me and I'm glad to be a part of it and glad to be associated with this administration that is moving rapidly to do that under the leadership of uh, Secretary Austin. So I appreciate and am honored to be a part of this panel. Thank you so much, Mr. Secretary. Thank you very much, Congressman. Um, thank you all for listening. Um, so as mentioned, I'm the president of the National Naval Officers Association, which works with the Navy, the Coast Guard, Marine Corps, Public Health Service, NOAA, and Merit. But it's not the only affinity group. Uh, there's rocks under the wise leadership of uh, General uh, Larry Gillespie, ROCKS has been around for a very long time, working the same area from the Army side. Uh, and there's also AFCOMA for the Air Force and Dr. Al Mosley. So I feel like I'm a representative for all of them being here in the fight to continue to move forward in diversity, equity, inclusion, to make a better force, to be more ready to help defend this country throughout the complex, confrontational, and confusing, often, uh, world that we are in and continue to move on. I would ask everybody to think about two things for Black History Month, Women's History Month, or any history month in our nation. Number one, all of us in uniform have taken that same oath, support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, both foreign and domestic. Well, what does that Constitution say about justice? What does that Constitution say about the blessings of liberty? What does that Constitution say about a more perfect union? That's why we fight. That's why we serve. That's why these different months in different parts of our history are important. And that's why we should all be very proud to be Americans, warts and all, understanding our history, but moving forward together. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our program today reflections on the legacy of black Americans and the U.S. Armed Services. 
We'd like to thank the Smithsonian for hosting us and everyone viewing online. And we would especially like to thank our esteemed panelists for their service, their dedication, and their contribution to today's program. Please remain in your seats for the departure of the official party. Thank you.